Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, everybody would like to wel welcome uh, Cyril O'Peel. Uh, he is here from Boston College to give us a talk today on, let's see, the surprising thermal properties of CM carbonaceous chondrites. So Cyril, uh, thank you for joining us and go ahead and take it away. Excellent, excellent, thank you. Um, so again, my name is uh, Cyril O'Peel. Um, I'm a, uh, in the physics department at Boston College. Happy to be here today. Uh, at the Planetary Science Institute, and uh, to share some uh, work that I've been doing uh, and some published uh, research. Um, if you haven't had a proper amount of caffeine yet, you are here. Just want to kind of orient you to where you are. And if you haven't had your, you know, proper amount of caffeine or a nap in the afternoon, uh, you just know where we are. Um, the the I want to thank. I want to begin this talk by thanking. Uh, my colleagues, um, Guy Consamagno is the director of the Vatican Observatory. And if anyone's fault, if there's anyone's fault about uh, doing this work, it's his because he got me involved in this. I uh, also want to thank uh, Dan Britt uh, from the University of Central Florida, where he is the uh, uh, PI of the survey class uh, um, uh, uh, project uh, from NASA. And also uh, want to thank uh, Bob Mackey. Um, who's the curator of, of meteorites at the Vatican Observatory in Rome? The um, this this talk actually began um, in many ways many years ago when Guy came to my laboratory at Boston College and was um, and suggested um, we might work together. And uh, the question he asked is, well, "What do you measure?" And the reason I, I want to say a little bit about that is because my background is uh, photo emission, spectroscopy, and it's also thermoelectric materials making and measuring materials. And in uh, in in uh, making and measuring thermoelectric materials, you need to be able to measure um, heat capacity, the uh, thermal conductivity, um, and uh, that actually uh, is something that, at least in the astronomy world, is not done very much. At least the thermal conductivity measurements, particularly at low temperature. Uh, but that's in some ways the bread and butter of uh, working in uh, thermoelectric materials. So um, this is in some ways uh, I'm an interdisciplinary person. I'm not an astronomer, uh, but I consider I, I consider um, meteorites as materials, and I look at them as such. Uh, today I want to talk about the heat capacity of the CM2 uh, carbonaceous chondrites, uh, heat capacity, thermal conductivity. Um, I also do a technique uh, which is called linear thermal expansion, and uh, the, the range of temperatures is, you know, two to 300 Kelvin. Um, that's something that is normally not done in meteoritics, uh, but in my condensed matter world, um, uh, uh, where I, uh, when I was doing uh, photo emission and other uh, materials, um, particularly um, uranium-based materials, um, this was an important thing because there are some very important crystal transitions in linear thermal uh, um, in uranium compounds, and they can get picked up in linear thermal expansion. Be showing you some uh, the density of these materials, the meteorites that I've worked with, uh, and also the thermal uh, inertia, calculating the thermal inertia and thermal diffusivity. The five um, the five meteorites that were studied uh, for this project were Murchison, Murray, uh, Cold, Bachveld, uh, NWA seventy three hundred nine, and Giblet, Wilson one, um, and they're all CM twos. Before I uh, uh, discuss, before discussing the thermal and physical properties of a group of CM two chondrites, I want to ask a question about two asteroids, Vesta and Bennu. Now these are very different asteroids, but it's important, I think, to ask this question because this talk eventually might answer a question about the most recent uh, NASA expedition to retrieve some materials from Bennu. And uh, perhaps this talk will show shed some light on that. If we look, um, Bennu is uh, almost in the same orbit as Earth, so it's a near-Earth object. And uh, we see in the upper left uh, uh, slide there, uh, we see the uh, how even Bennu actually cuts into Earth's orbit. Now, Vesta, much larger uh, asteroid, is outside of Mars. We see in the lower screen there, the lower uh, diagram. But nonetheless, these are two uh, asteroids. They're close uh, to Earth somewhat, um, but they're very different. Now, um, taking a snapshot of Vesta and Bennu, we realize that um, uh, there's different kind of shapes uh, that we have for Vesta and Bennu. 
And uh, obviously, Vesta is much larger than Bennu. But the question really has to do with the surface. If we look at the surfaces, Vesta has a fairly um, smooth surface. It's pockmarked with, as we see in the left in the left uh, picture there, but uh, it's pockmarked from uh, meteorite strikes and asteroid strikes. But nonetheless, it actually appears to be fairly uh, smooth. Now, on the right, we see the Bennu surface. And um, well, one can only describe this as a rubble pile. And so the question really is, why are these surfaces so different? Um, it has to do with the material. But the uh, deeper kind of question is, why do you have a rubble pile? And is there any kind of uh, understanding of how do you make a rubble pile out of Bennu? So the question stands. I hope to be able to answer that at the end of this uh, talk. So let's uh, talk about measuring, actually, thermal and physical properties of the various um, um, that are done in, for this uh, paper. First of all, uh, I want to I want to begin by just simply saying is that I have a uh, a machine which is a cryogenic refrigerator. Um, its temperature range is two to four hundred Kelvin, so we get down as cold almost as cold as absolute zero, but certainly within the, the range of space uh, in the solar system and outer solar system. Magnetic field, it has a magnet, though that's not all that used, but the pressure in order to, uh, these, this is the inner vacuum pressure uh, for the samples um, so that they can be measured in vacuum. That that um, cylinder you see at the right has to do with a, uh, it's a doer. It's basically a big thermos bottle. And in the thermos bottle, there's about a hundred liters of liquid helium. And uh, I recycle uh, the liquid helium so I can stay cold for about two years. The measurement capabilities that are really important here are uh, heat capacity, thermal conductivity, and linear thermal expansion, because I can vary the temperature range in low pressure to be able to measure heat capacity, thermal conductivity, and linear thermal expression and expansion. Um, there's many things that I've done in the past, particularly with thermoelectrics um, and other uh, materials, and uh, you can measure uh, resonant ultrasound. Um, spectroscopy, you can tell Young's modulus and bulk modulus, cantilever magnetometry to get transitions. Um, I'm actually working on a probe to do through transmission of sound velocity. And then uh, there's all kinds of AC and DC magnetotransport measurements. But let me start by just for those people who are not actually uh, familiar perhaps with uh, specific heat or haven't done it a long time um, in your careers, What's important here is that, so there's a puck, and that puck is a, a sapphire platform that we can actually uh, see here. And you can put a sample on. The samples are usually about one millimeter by three by three, a mass being anywhere between 15 to 30 uh, milligrams. And uh, there's a heater on here, uh, and I'm expressing that heater kind of diagrammatically here. In the cartoon is a candle, so when you can actually heat heat the sample up in a very particular fashion. These wires are tungsten wires, uh, and they permit very little heat actually to the, uh, to, the, to the body of this puck. And essentially what you do for heat capacity is you heat something up and then you turn off the heat and you let it cool down. And so this, um, the heater is off in this fashion. And what you can do is um, if you know what the timing uh, and the temperature of these things, you can actually come down here and use the ABIT diabetic relaxation technique for specific heat analysis. And you can actually uh, determine what the specific heat is at a particular fixed temperature of the puck. Um, and uh, from that, you can actually derive through some you know, analysis. You can actually walk along, you know, going down in temperature, up in temperature, as you can see here. I actually have uh, just some sample um, data here. It's an OFHC uh, copper disc, and uh, this co uh, copper disc uh, has been measured. And I'm just simply saying is that these numbers here, tau, these these tau two and tau one, are actually the parameters by which you actually derive essentially the location at a particular temperature. What is the specific heat capacity of a particular material? Enough said. The second technique has to do with thermal conductivity measurements, and uh, uh, this puck that we see here on the on the left um, is a is a piece of um, um, 70, 7309 um, uh, CM2 chondrite, and it's hooked up uh, in order with 
two different, um, this is a heater and this is two different thermometers in order to monitor a temperature. So the heater gives a pulse of heat, it's a square wave pulse, and you get to know the difference between the top and the bottom of this sample. Uh, in this diagram, we actually see here that um, you can actually measure. So uh, energy divided by time is essentially watts. Um, so we can actually monitor one side. So this is kind of the hot side, this is the cold side. And you could actually see that the heat is going is going through here. Part of the reason, and I know this probably will uh, fall on, painfully on some of the ears of some of the people who work with meteorites here, is that in order to do this technique, you need a uniform cross section so that the square wave can actually go down here. And so I have to, unfortunately, um, cut the meteorites up uh, and in a particular geometric form. However, uh, this is a highly reproducible technique, and this technique is used uh, throughout um, uh, therm uh, the um, um, work in thermoelectrics uh, in order to determine thermal conductivity. Um, kappa, which is the thermal conductivity, is essentially the ratio of um, the, uh, the heat, uh, the watts divided by the temperature and the length per, per unit length. And so we get some data from this. Uh, I want to say something about linear thermal expansion. And this is a technique which is, I would say, for people in meteoritics, or even particularly in physics in general, uh, is a fairly rare technique. Um, a friend of mine uh, by the name of George Schmiedeshoff, who passed away a couple of years ago, um, built this uh, device. It's a capacitive dilatometer, and it's it's uh, an amazing device to measure very small uh, changes uh, according to either magnetic field, a changes in magnetic field or temperature. And essentially what we do is we monitor the temperature. There's a Cernox here, thermometer on top. There's actually one on bottom. I didn't put it on here in this slide. But essentially we see a sample right here. That's actually a piece of, it's an aluminum slug. That's a standard. Um, but let me just simply say is that using a cutaway here is that a sample we represented here as D um, as it expands or contracts, depending on if it's warming or cooling, you can actually push this against um, this, this uh, kind of lower uh, capacitor plate. This is an upper capacitor plate. This is the gap right in here, this gap here. And so as this sample basically gets longer or smaller, this capacitor uh, here monitors um, the distance between the capacitor plates. This equation, capacitance is equal to um, this constants, this is the area of the capacitor plate, which doesn't change. And this is uh, emissivity, which doesn't change. But we see that C is proportional to one over D. And because this is a reciprocal relationship, capacitance, uh, if measured correctly and accurately, um, you can actually understand the very small changes. So in order to do that, we measure actually using this capacitance bridge. It's It actually measures down to attofarads, which is hard to imagine, but it's actually an incredibly small amount of, of, um, uh, of capacitance. And um, we have had George uh, Schmiedeshoff, and I've had some, a lot of success in measuring things very accurately. It was originally designed to do uh, transitions, uh, crystallographic changes in transitions but it's an important uh, device um, for us as well. And you'll see why in a little bit. Um, just wanna mention that these samples, Cole Bachvel, um, uh, all the and, and all the rest here, uh, we measured the density. This has all been done by uh, Archimedes method after the samples that basically came out of the machine. Um, the porosity measurements, you can, you can actually see that the porosity is actually fairly high. So these are, um, uh, they're, not, they're not terribly dense materials, but what they are is, um, we get to see that there's a lot of holes uh, here, uh, typical for CM2s. Heat capacity, I just want to kind of give you a sense of the expectations. Heat capacity uh, is, uh, this is a normal uh, C sub P versus T curve, and uh, outlined by the Debye model or the Einstein model, you actually can see that. So this is a typical uh, measurement of what you should see for any material. And the height of the uh, 300, Kel 300 Kelvin value depends on really the, the, the material itself. Thermoconductivity, if we're kind of looking for things, we have both a phonon contribution and electron contribution. Now, because these materials have very low, um, they're, not, they're not conductors, the electron contribution is very, very low. So 
uh, essentially the, th the, the, the graph on the right here is really not um, all that uh, dominant. It's actually the phonon contribution to the left, uh, on the left side of the screen that actually shows so T cube behavior at low temperature and T to the one to T to the minus one behavior at kind of higher uh, temperatures. What's important here is that the scattering mechanisms uh, take precedence here in when we're talking about thermal conductivity. And also is that this peak that you see uh, where the two curves kind of meet at the left, that actually that peak can actually be much less depending on whether you have what kind of scattering mechanisms. So if high impurity levels happen, that that essentially that peak gets squished down. As an example, um, I can show you here, if we look at yellow serpentine, which is a mineral, a terrestrial mineral, it actually doesn't have much of a peak. It actually has a very broad, broad peak. But if we look at diapsite, which is in the blue, we can actually see that there is a very defined peak. And this actually has to do a lot with the stiffness as well as the mechanism, you know, the phonon dominated mechanism and the scattering mechanism that is actually happening. So it's just important to kind of get a sense of um, how, what, what thermal conductivity could look like. Now, finally, um, linear thermal expansion, contraction, um, this has to do with, you know, bonding of the atom atoms in and the crystal uh, lattice movement. Um, I give you examples of what a kind of a good behavior, a good behaved material like aluminum, which is a standard. And so that actually I give on the left there, uh, this is a, a sample of aluminum, very, very pure aluminum polycrystal, and uh, three different people measured, uh, and it comes out to be the same. I, I have on the right here also a well-behaved material, um, uh, but it's a uh, 304 stainless. Um, this is a sample from Los Alamos that they used to actually calibrate uh, the dilatometer. So essentially, it's very well-behaved. It kind of has a broad uh, kind of a, a broadness to it, and it's kind of rising. It's reminiscent, actually, of uh, heat capacity. Now, also is that linear thermal expansion doesn't always have to be so well behaved like here. It can actually be a little bit different. Years ago, I measured uh, nickel two manganese gallium, which uh, has a major crystal transition in between at around 190 Kelvin. And that's actually what you see there. And so the alpha picks up. Uh, it, that's the expansion coefficient um, that you have. And on the right, we actually see a silica glass where you actually have negative thermal expansion below basically 150 Kelvin for various silica glass. So these are the kind of things that you might see. Uh, I just want to say very briefly, we have, you know, three basic groups of meteorites, Murchison, uh, uh, I mean, stony meteorites, iron meteorites, and stony iron meteorites. Uh, here's some examples of those. Um, and here's the, also a breakdown, uh, around 94% are stony iron, about five, and then the palisites are uh, around 1%. So I'm going to only be talking about um, the stony meteorites. But let's look at the pantheon here. We're actually in the undifferentiated, undifferentiated meteorites, the chondrites or stony meteorites. We're actually going to be talking down here. Um, a lot can be said about these other materials. And actually, um, this project that I'm working on uh, actually deals with um, uh, some Martian lunar iron um, and some uh, other kinds of uh, the HED uh, meteorites. But that's for another talk. Um, these are pictures of the, the five meteorites that we have actually in this consideration here. Uh, so we have Murchison, we have NWA 7309, we have Murray, uh, Cole Bachvel, um, and um, Winsel Wong. Uh, we actually there's a there's a great deal of similarity. Actually, the Gibbet Winslow one is a, a camp a sample that I actually took a picture of, and uh, we see the chondrules and actually in the matrix uh, for the, for this. Um, they're very similar materials. They've been found at different times and different places uh, on the world. Uh, most of them have a fairly low weathering, so we're actually measuring some of the uh, kind of uh, as as close to the characteristics as we could. So let me just say a little bit. CM2 carbonate, uh, carbonate chondrites really are primitive meteorites and they they record a chemical information. Um, there's volatile rich materials, uh, both in the early solar system, but also in the materials themselves. Um, the key here uh, that is CM2 carbonaceous chondrites contain both anhydrous minerals like olivine and pyroxene, 
along with abundant hydrous phosphosilicates uh, contained in the, in the uh, meteorite matrix, and which is the kind of that black surface, that black stuff in between uh, the chondrules. Um, key to this uh, presentation is understanding uh, that we actually have some hydrous phosphosilicates. And um, uh, I like to call it clay because clay is a type of phosphosilicate um, that actually uh, has layers because um, oftentimes clay is actually formed in layers um, because of aqueous alteration of materials um, uh, in, in, in a particular environment. So let me actually show you um, the data. Now, um, this is a well-behaved material. Certainly this is specific heat capacity versus temperature. I've actually, um, the, the data is offset uh, if I if I didn't offset the data, they'd all be collapsed into kind of a, uh, a kind of a rude curve. Um, but what's what's important here is that there are no major transitions uh, that we can actually see at this level. We also have uh, there's no so there's there's no deviations from the heat capacity. If there were crystal trans transformation or something really odd going on, uh, magnetic or uh, crystallographic transitions, we would see it represented in the uh, in the material in the in these curves, and so the, it's actually very well behaved. Uh, just want to mention also is that from this data, we can actually calc uh, calculate uh, the divide temperature of each of these materials, uh, and also the effective molar mass. Um, part of it, the reason I do this is that um, you know the, the divide temperature is really the highest normal mode of vibration, and it correlates with uh, elastic properties. Um, I think it's actually important to kind of explore these kind of elastic properties in all materials. Um, also, is that from from the divide, uh, from this data heat capacity data, you can actually calculate the effective molar mass. Um, what's actually really helpful here is if you actually look, all of the effective molar masses are around the same. They're actually kind of averaged the same, and the divide temperature uh, is the same, is essentially the same. Uh, what that tells you is that these are um, uh, it's they're all well behaved um there uh, and the fact that these are not very high means that there's a certain level of stiffness but as the by temperature rises that usually says that the material is actually very stiff um you know for uh, quartz which is a very stiff material the by temperature is a lot higher the next um slide here is um uh, thermal conductivity versus uh, temperature and again I have for clarity um, offset the data so that you can actually see how it's actually changing uh, or developing over time. It goes from high of less than two, uh, 300 Kelvin, uh, and all these things tend to towards zero. What's important to note here is that um, these are highly disordered materials. And so the thermal conductivity will not have a, for th CM2s, will have uh, not a, a very large peak, though for the uh, NWA 7309, that's actually having the largest kind of, it's trying to rise to a peak, uh, but it's probably has the most order as, a, as opposed to the other ones. And so we actually can see um, as it decreases from uh, 300 Kelvin down to zero, um, these are kind of monotonic. And obviously the, 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 these are very low thermal conductivities, uh, well below two um, watts per meter Kelvin. Now, this is something that was very unusual when I measured these materials. You just go back is that the Kohlbach, um, uh, uh, Kohlbachvel um, meteorite was a uh, piece of a Vatican meteorite that uh, Guy Consumano gave me and uh, said that, um, well, maybe measure this. Um, there was really no expectation uh, about doing linear thermal expansion. But I actually thought, well, I have the technique. Um, I may as well use it, see what happens. Um, as you can see, going from uh, low uh, low temperature to higher temperature, um, up until about 200 Kelvin, it's expanding like a normal material would expand. But then all of a sudden you have this enormous drop. Now, what's important to realize is that the, the drops of all of these materials, uh, it happens at around 235 Kelvin. Uh, that's essentially the kind of the, the midway peak here is around 235. 
Um, the variance between the, you know, Jibit Winsawan and let's say uh, the uh, NW7309 in terms of the depth has to do with probably is just texturing uh, how the material is actually uh, changing uh, or perhaps even some weathering. It's very important though um, to tell you that I didn't have a clue as to what this was uh, when I first measured this. I measured the cold Bachvel and then I, I said, you know, maybe this is real, maybe this isn't real. Um, no one had ever measured any materials like this before. Uh, and so I had to kind of confirm it. My friend, uh, uh, George Schmiedeshoff, I sent the data to him and he initially thought, Sai, nothing, th there's no kind of transition. And he's an expert in in, in uh, linear thermal expansion. He said, there can't be anything like this. It's just too big. And uh, so I recalibrate everything, sent him the data, the original data, the last, the, the final data. And he said, well, I guess you have something. And then I asked him, I said, what is it? And he said, I haven't a clue because I'm not I'm not into meteorites. But he said, that's, you know, a second order transition. This is a second order transition as opposed to a four step transition. And now you have to find out what that is. So, but really what's important here is that eventually these materials uh, go through this huge transition, they bottom out, and then they come at three cal 300 Kelvin back to almost zero. Um, they're a bit distorted. But it's important, and I'll tell you in a minute why this 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 actually is happening. But to see this phenomenon, and by the way, negative thermal expansion is very rare. There's only um, maybe a hundred materials that have been measured uh, that show it. And understanding what is behind the negative thermal expansion is a very important kind of part of this paper. Now, also being a careful physicist, um, I was very concerned that I was seeing something that really wasn't there. And so um, there's a relationship between heat capacity and linear thermal expansion. And so if I could find um, the transition in heat capacity, and it's actually hard to find, um, this is probably this transition here, this bottoming out here. So this is a C sub P. I took very fine temperature um, measurements here, and then took the and the the dark the the filled in ones. Um, the solid uh, symbols are actually the derivative, which is over here. And so what we actually do is we actually see that there are broad transitions in this, uh, and you see that the scale is actually rather expanded here. Um, and so that I could actually say, before I published anything, um, that this is actually real. And so, because no one had ever seen this before and it had to be confirmed. So the heat capacity actually is not as sensitive as the linear thermal expansion. And so even though it's not as sensitive, heat capacity is extremely sensitive. But in this case, um, linear thermal expansion uh, kind of showed the way, and then we confirmed it with heat capacity. Now, <clears throat> why is there negative thermal expansion? So I mentioned before that uh, CM2s have um, olivine, pyroxene, but also they have phyllosilicates. And phyllosilicates uh, basically are, you know, uh, uh, aluminosilicates, and they have um, a, octahed a, a, a tetrahedral layer. They have an octahedral layer in in the actual material, and so we actually have so we have oxygens. This is a three dimensional, and this is kind of just a side cut. So here's oxygen, silicon, aluminum, and hydrogen. And essentially, what happens is that um, these layers, um, and because of the uniformity of layers and the link between them by hydroxyl groups, um, those hydroxyl groups um, can actually vibrate. Um, a major component of, of, of clay, China clay, made out of real China, uh, and other clay materials like kaolin, um, has very similar um, silicate uh, tetrahedra. And so um, we have to kind of understand what is the, you know, how do we have these stacked layers, which are very kind of uniform in a sense, but also is that um, what happens, and, and it was actually looking at the properties of phyllosilicates or clays that we actually were able to understand um, how this happens. So how what's the thermal conduct, the negative thermal expansion behavior? And what it is is that if we have uh, a tetrahedral layer here, we have an octahedral heat here, what happens is that, that all these atoms, particularly the hydroxyl groups, are actually um, bonded from the top to the bottom. And there are two different mechanisms, both the longitudinal 
as well as transverse uh, vibrations. So longitudinal vibrations essentially go this way with temperature. And um, if you think out, it averages, if, if your movement is only here, it averages out because it's going up and down at the same time. However, if you have transverse vibrations in um, of this of this molecule group, what happens is that this essentially creates kind of um, and what is normally considered here for negative thermal expansion behavior is kind of the guitar string. So if you have a this is a guitar string here, you eventually when you actually create this kind of you know vibration, this transverse vibration, what happens is that there's a tension in this guitar string here. Um, or in this bond. And what happens is that as the vibration is excited in a particular way for transverse vibrations, they overwhelm at least at 235 Kelvin. The transverse vibrations overwhelm the longitudinal vibrations. And that's why we see this um, negative thermal expansion. And that's why it's so incredibly reproducible here because of the essentially the dynamic between longitudinal and transverse vibrations of the of the hydroxyl groups between the tetrahedral and um, uh, octahedral um, uh, layers. So I want to quickly go over calculating values of thermal diffusivity um, and thermal uh, uh, thermal inertia. Uh, in many ways, this is what we were trying to get to: is thermal diffusivity values and thermal inertia values. And I show there on the slide. Uh, how we calculate. So it's kappa, C sub P, and, uh, and density uh, in different forms. Um, just important to say is that thermal diffusivity is essentially explains the penetration of heat in a material. And thermal uh, inertia is that it's really the resistance of a material to heat up or cool down. Um, and these are for meteoritic uh, kind of understandings affecting uh, your and Yurkovsky effects and uh, planet modeling. So uh, I believe this may be one, certainly the first uh, carbonaceous chondrites thermal diffusivity going from 300 Kelvin down to um, basically 5 Kelvin. Um, we notice that at high temperatures above 100 Kelvin, very little changes. However, as we go down below cal cal 100 Kelvin, we actually see that the thermal diffusivity rises significantly uh, for the different uh, materials. And uh, it's this is actually... Uh, uh, I, I haven't found in any of literature anything uh, this cold, um, but these, um, in terms of these kind of temperatures, uh, typical curves, but also is important to see um, that these materials uh, are behaving um, in this fashion. Now, thermal inertia, as I said, is kind of the resistance of uh, material uh, to heat. And uh, uh, the, 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 this, these, um, numbers here on the left here, it's times 10 to the three. Um, so essentially what we do is these are now all this data is um, it's on a it's on a, a linear linear scale and these have been uh, uh, displaced so that they don't collapse all on one. Uh, and essentially what's happening here is that yes, there's a general decline and we can actually kind of accentuate it using kind of lines is that around 150 Kelvin you have this kind of a uh, general kind of uh, uh, accelerated decrease in terms of thermal conductivity. But also there's a there's a kind of a, an inflection point here in this curve. Um, and it's important just simply to point it out from terms of the thermal conductivity. And so I took the derivative of the thermal um, uh, thermal inertia. And what we see is that around 55 Kelvin for all the materials, all these CM2s, is a kind of, um, you know, a, a peak. Uh, that we can see around 55 Kelvin. It's more defined in some than in others. Uh, what it's also saying that this actually is probably mostly from the uh, C sub P heat capacity, specific heat capacity data, where there's actually a change of regime in terms of thermal properties. So no one had actually measured any of these down below 100 Kelvin before. Uh, but it, so it's actually important to just simply note that the regime change is actually happening around 55 Kelvin. And then again, temperature uh, or the thermal, the, the this is actually decreasing rather significantly. So I am uh, want to kind of say a couple of things. So the heat capacity is basically it's very expected behavior for, for these meteorites because they're aluminum silicate insulator composites. That's the material they are. 
um, and they're well behaved, no major transitions. The thermal conductivity um, has to do with low, um, low temperature behaviors around T cubed, and then the high temperatures around uh, T to the minus one. Uh, and also disorder in impurity scattering um, eliminates the shark peak that you would see in diopside or quartz. Um, and uh, there's a huge amount of scattering. These are disordered materials, and they also have high porosity. The temperature expand, the thermal expansion, consistent uh, behavior, negative thermal expansion, particularly centered around 235 Kelvin. And it's confirmed, uh, importantly, by heat, uh, heat capacity measurements. Um, and the transverse vibrations between the tetrahedral and octahedral layer are responsible for this as the transverse mode vibrations dominate longitudinal vibrations. Thermal diffusivity is a gradual decrease from 300 to about 60, and then decrease is more dramatic. Um, and that behavior changes around at uh, about 55 Kelvin. Thermal inertia is constant for um, uh, 100 to uh, uh, above 100, or below 100, uh, but exhibits a um, significant increase um, as we go below 100 uh, Kelvin. Um, this, these data are very uh, familiar. They're, they're very uh, consistent with other data for ordinary and h &L chondrites um, and uh, across the particular temperature range. Um, and also is that this, this data yields some possibilities for thermal modeling of CM2 uh, meteorites but also this process also can be applied to other meteorite species. Now, let me get back to the question that I asked before. Why are these surfaces so different, Vesta and Bennu? Well, they're different materials, that's true, but why is there a rubble pile on Bennu and why is there no essentially rubble pile on Vesta? Now, one of the possibilities which we're investigating in the OSIRIS-REx um, uh, experiments is that what kind of materials do we actually have coming from Bennu? If, in fact, the, the Bennu has um, uh, phyllosilicates, uh, CM2 or CM1, C, C1, um, CI, uh, uh, carbonaceous chondrites, there is the possibility that um, we've actually kind of looked at the mechanism because you can, you know, just like heating, pouring water, pouring hot boiling water in a coffee cup, uh, a cheap coffee cup, you can actually crack uh, material, you can crack a cup by actually not being able to heat uh, or cool uh, a particular material. And so that's why that's why a cheap uh, China cup can actually crack is because you kind of heat one part. One of the ways you, you, you stop that is you put a spoon in so that the heat is actually taken by the spoon as opposed to the ceramic. But what's important here is that if they make these materials on Bennu are um, essentially phyllosilicates, uh, we actually may be able to make um, a measurement, uh, uh, and I have good authority that the sample is coming, that um, looking at the linear thermal expansion, we'll be able to say, is this similar to the CM2 um, data that we've seen in the past or not? I want to thank again Guy Consolmagno, the director of the Vatican Observatory. I'd like to thank Bob Mackey. And Bob Mackey actually worked in my lab back at Boston College. He's actually building right there a pycnometer um, that was, his, I think, it was his first pycnometer, which he made at Boston College. Um, and then also Dan Britt, um, grand old man uh, at uh, Professor University of Central Florida, uh, and he's the class uh, survey uh, PI. Uh, thank NASA and uh, everyone for giving me money to do this. Um, thanks for exploring me this today. Questions? All right, thank you. That that's great. Hi, this is Matt Sigler. Um, hey, Matt. I was, I, I was wondering about so you know one of the mysteries on the Osiris Rex mission was these you know little particles that were flying off early yes. on. Yes. Um, and Jamie Malaro, who's at PSI, I don't think she's on the call today, but she uh, she wrote a couple of papers about it possibly being due to the thermal expansion and the cracking of the rocks, and that that could cause the enough energy to to shoot off some of these small particles. Um, does this measurement kind of confirm that? Was would would I, that be I, a cause and effect that the I would say I would say is that um, 
uh, if you've ever poured hot water into a into a mug and it's cracked, um, you realize that the mug can actually move. And so the cracking can actually cause a movement uh, by this. Uh, the other thing it's important to remember is that, and it's funny, I, I actually watched the return of the capsule here at University of uh, Arizona with the group. And I was sitting next to a fellow who actually uh, did all the pho photography, uh, you know, did all the, the cameras and everything. And I asked, I asked him, I said, why are these particles flying all around here? He said, well, a G is very low, but also is that it's really odd that the temperature is changing so much. One of the things I just realized is that the temperature range it, of the surface of uh, Bennu, and this is just from the data uh, recently received, uh, it's from 200 Kelvin to about 350 Kelvin, because um, it's in it's in it's it's essentially in Earth's orbit. Um, it the, the hopping, uh, I I kind of like call it kind of cracking or hopping. Yes, um, these are thermal changes. And if if it's um, if it's just right and they're changing, you know, the it's going through that transition. Yes, th there's 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 energy, and it may be actually going from you know thermal energy to mechanical energy. Um, so there is the possibility. It's because G is so low; it's a small asteroid. So I hope that's answered. And I would say yes. And by the way, I wasn't looking for this. It was only because I was looking at something at negative thermal expansion, and I was thinking. Well, this is really neat because there's not there's not really much of this around. But it was only when my collaborators Dan Britt and uh, Guy said, "Well, there might be a connection here." Uh, and also, Delbo wrote a letter uh, a, a letter in Nature uh, that actually was kind of confirming that this actually is this would make its sense at least for the cracking. Um, so things are at very um, so you these things are light materials. You have small g. And the thing's moving at, at quite a at quite a uh, a high pace. So I would say is it does confirm those papers that you mentioned a minute ago. That's and a really neat connection. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, you know, and the thing is, it has to do with the fact that this is an interdisciplinary thing. Here's my 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 expertise is is condensed matter physics, looking at things and saying, okay, well, what's this phenomenon, and um, it, and, you know, I was actually hesitant to publish the negative thermal expansion because no one else did. No one else has published this. And, you know, it could easily have been rejected. But that's why I went to do the heat capacity, because if you have transitions in heat capacity, even the derivative, something's going on. Because the thermodynamics doesn't lie. And not many people actually understand the, the linear thermal expansion. Not many people do it. Um, except people, I, I did a postdoc at Los Alamos, so that's why we. That's I was with I have a group of people who are kind of experts in this, and that's why we're able to to confirm it. Any questions? Any further questions? Uh, uh, brother Guy, are you here? yeah, I just wanted to, I, I wanted to add on one one more piece that uh, the Nature paper pointed out. And this goes back to Sai's question, why does Bennu look like it's covered in rocks? And um, not only Vesta looks smoother, but other asteroids, other small asteroids like Itakawa have smooth, sandy regions, which Bennu doesn't. Mm -hmm. And it could be that the cracking in the rocks means that they're impervious to micrometeorites. So a micrometeorite that would take a solid rock and turn it into dust will just pass through a rock that's already thoroughly cracked. And that's why the you know the, the surface of Bennu has a thermal inertia that makes it look like it's covered with dust, but in fact, it, you know, to the naked eye, they look like rocks. So they're rocks that have the inertia of dust because they've been so cracked by these thermal processes. And that's why they weren't they weren't turned by micrometeorites into you know layers of sand, but maintained their uh, their rocky, rocky sort of image. Absolutely agree with that. Because they were pre-fractured, they they can't get broken up more. Oh, that's basically the idea. If if something is really porous, then a micrometeorite will pass through it rather than depositing its energy on the surface and chipping things off. I see. Uh, uh, one uh, another idea is that there are neutrinos passing through my body right now, uh, billions of them. 
And because I'm fairly porous, even though I don't look that way, um, the neutrinos go right through. And it has to do with, because of the size of the, the different objects, me, and then my own kind of porosity, at some level, um, it works. So neutrinos pass through us all the time, billions of them. It's a, maybe a bad analogy, but I think that's really what, what's going on here. Uh, I have a, a, a question. Um, since we are talking about uh, uh, thermal cracking. Um, if instead of um, these uh, different uh, varieties of uh, dust in a broader sense, uh, if we have dust ice mixture, mm -hmm. uh, how would that affect? Um, well, part of it is that the reason for negative thermal expansion behavior that I see here is that you really are kind of looking at the phyllosilicate, you know, layers. So if you actually had, you know, if you actually had penetration by water, um, I have a feeling is that you wouldn't see anything because the, it, the characteristic of the expansion of water would probably maybe predominate. And part of it is in terms of the scales. So um, the, um, the 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 kind of negative thermal expansion we're talking about mm -hmm. is very large um, in terms of kind of in the world of negative thermal expansion. Um, there are other materials that have very slight uh, amounts of negative thermal expansion. And so that, you know, the, the material can kind of stretch. So I would say is that um, if you start mixing water with this, I mean, in a, I would say that these are fairly kind of stable materials. And, and so that the matrix of um, uh, tetrahedra, um, you know, uh, and octahedra, you know, you've got these kind of stable layers. Mm -hmm. that, they're layers that have hydroxide groups in between. And so the system is working. To add water to it, you'd probably change the system. And you may actually change the temperature of transition, or you may wipe it out. Okay, thanks. Okay. Any other questions? But the expansion only happens when you have a phyllosilicate component, right? For uh, yeah, I'm just trying to think of, of the applications sure, for the sure. moon, which also has these cold areas and and goes through that same temperature range. Is as long as there's no phyllosilicates, they they'll kind of expand and contract normally. Um, yes. If you have, you know, let's say at two thirty five. And there's no ex there's no phyllosilicates or a material that so each material would have kind of its own um, uh, behaviors and so if you have don't have phyllosilicates or enough of them um, uh, or kind of arranged in the right way that you probably not going to see this kind of behavior. However, uh, I also just want to mention in the in the talk, I'm going to just show I'm going to go back to something. I might be able to do that. I actually threw in a little um, a hint of something. So I go back here to linear thermal expansion. If we have silica glass, okay. Now, if we have a material, natural material that has a lot of silica glass in it, um, you might actually see some uh, linear thermal expansion or contraction if that material is a sufficient quantity and you can actually, um, and you're going through that temperature transition. Now on the moon, you just mentioned, you know, if you have glass in your materials, you might actually see it. Um, yeah, I guess the, the mystery that I'm trying to hint at at the moon here is that we see evidence that the PSRs, the really cold areas, you know, that never get, you know, above 100 and, 50 right. Kelvin or something, or, or even colder. Um, they seem to be higher porosity. Mm -hmm. That And one idea is that the individual grains haven't expanded and contracted as much mm -hmm. as ones that have, you know, are closer to the equator and go through this kind of temperature range like you're talking about here, the, the 200 plus Kelvin. So I was kind of wondering about that concept is... Is sure. if you're cold enough and you won't go through this? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, you might, I mean, if you're in the right place in space 
Um, let me say, so for Bennu, if Bennu was much warmer, I never would have seen the 235 Kelvin transition and I wouldn't see it because, you know, it's it just doesn't exist. I'm going to show you a bit of data, which actually um, uh, we talked about at the LA, the METSOC meeting, METSEC 86 meeting. And I'm going to just go right down here because as you, because you mentioned this, I will show you the data. We haven't published it yet. So this is this is lunar, this is the heat capacity data for lunar heat capacity of a group of samples um, that we measured, kind of, you know, regular, very consistent. Then there's a linear thermal expansion, other, sorry, sorry, linear uh, thermal conductivity, again. Um, then we also show the thermal inertia and the thermal diffusivity of these lunar samples. It's the same, same group of six samples. And then <clears throat> this is the linear thermal expansion for the lunar meteorite collection. And so um, if you remember that slide I showed you just a minute ago about the silicon glass, is that when I measured the lunar uh, thermal expansion measurements, um, I actually decided to measure, you know, the linear thermal expansion. And when I saw that there was another basically negative thermal expansion behavior at low temperatures, I wondered what the heck could this be? And so, but I realized now that there's a lot of glass in um, in in lunar materials um, because of the volcanic processes and creating gla glass. And so this is the reason for this. Um, I, I'm not going to say that the the, the lunar uh, the lunar surface experiences the cycling that might be necessary to kind of create cra uh, cracks, but also it's important to realize this is a very small feature. It's tiny compared to the one that's at the CM2s, and just you know in terms of kind of scale. I hope that help. It might be helpful for you to kind of answer your question. You probably weren't expecting to see linear thermal expansion data for lunar samples, but they're in every one. And it's because there's glass in the samples. Cool, thanks. That's really neat. Okay. That, and we're working on this paper um, and try to get this out as soon as possible. All right. Is there any, uh... By the way, I don't see any, I don't see any phyllosilicate evidence from the linear thermal expansion in lunar meteorites. However, the, at lower temperatures, we see glass. And that that's what actually this is, the data is telling us there's glass there. Sir, that's it. Thank you, Matt. All right, uh, are there any more questions? Only once, and twice. All right, well, thank you so much, Cyril, for joining us today. It was a very, very interesting talk. Great right. delight. Thanks so much to uh, the uh, Planetary Science Institute. I uh, appreciate um, you hosting this. And uh, I'm uh, I'm really glad to be able to, to be on today. So take right. care. Yeah, thank you. You too. Thank you. Great. Thanks.